Hello, everyone. Uh, our presenter today is Professor Stefan Lutnega. Um, he's a assistant professor at tenure track at the TU Munich and uh, also affiliated with the Bernhard the Munich Institute of Robotics and Machine Intelligence and the Munich Data Science Institute. Um, he leads the Smart Robotics Lab and uh, also holds a visiting reader position at the Imperial College London, his previous post. He uh, got his PhD from Zurich in 2014. Uh, don't think I missed anything, and uh, welcome. Okay, thanks a lot, Diego, for uh, the invite also. It's a pleasure to talk uh, in Australia. Um, let me start then. Okay, so I wanted to start with um, just a bit of a motivational video of something, some work that we have done recently. Uh, this is actually a, a collaboration in a, a bigger European project, um, also with, with Ido's former advisor, with Maurice Fallon in Oxford, by the way. Um, so here's a drone flying around completely autonomously in a forest. It's a relatively dense forest. Um, so you don't necessarily have GPS available here. So you're not actually using GPS here. You're only using onboard sensing. You can see on the left-hand side, there's the uh, grayscale image stream. And then we are also using, um, we are also predicting depth maps. You can see that on the bottom live um, from stereo. So this is uh, deep learned, um, quite dense stereo. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the trajectory that is being reconstructed, the, the full pose of the drone uh, from our visual inertial SLAM system. Um, allowing them uh, together with some kind of dense mapping that we do that you can see here as well to fly around autonomously and avoid the trees not actually crashing into them. And the feedback to the user is actually also quite important in this process that you can see what's going on here. Um, so you see where the drone is, what kind of uh, motion trajectories are being planned. So this is all in real time life. Um, fed to the operator. So the, the overall goal, maybe I should say here, flying through the forest is to do precision forestry. So you want to actually create maps that are really quite accurate, that can serve um, as a basis for decision making for, for a forestry uh, decision making. Right. So this is, is perhaps a, um, a typical kind of mobile robotics application where you can see different elements coming together. Um, including also this element of, of insight, of overview, um, what's actually going on. So perhaps not so surprisingly, this is a fairly traditional kind of a uh, uh, real-time control loop that we are applying here, where you have some elements of perception, then you have some uh, different module on uh, state estimation and mapping, performing the, the onboard SLAM. Um, then you feed that perhaps to some motion planning and ultimately um, to feedback controller, right? And then you might have some some knowledge that you, you build up on the drone in this case, um, or that you might have a priori already. So again, this is a sort of more classical model robotics approach. Um, it has this advantage that uh, these kind of representations that we're using here are well known to people, including also operators. So you can actually um, also uh, introspect what's going on. At the same time, we also introduce these kind of single points of failures, I would argue, right? So you might have errors in the module outputs. You might even have inherent limitations um, that are just a, a function of the chosen um, representations here, you know, positions, map representations whatsoever. And um, yeah, so that is that is definitely a, a disadvantage in, in this case. So of course, then um, some more radical kind of learning based approaches came along where you much more try to kind of end to end learn uh, from perception signals to control what you might want to do um, in order to eliminate these kind of signal points of failure. And of course, you kind of trade that off with um, a lack of guarantees and difficulty to introspect as well as, and that's, I think, even more important, um, as soon as you're going towards more complex tasks, um, this doesn't really scale very well anymore. You really need so much data that um, you're, you're simply going to lack, especially if you want to... Uh, to, to, to do a task that needs training in the real world. And I would argue some tasks will then ultimately need at least some element of training in the real world because we still 
we still don't quite know how to simulate everything um, perfectly. So therefore, in my talk, I will kind of argue for a sort of mixed approach uh, that we have been using uh, quite a lot, um, where you can actually now maybe train these individual elements here. Uh, you can add some, some learning uh, to it and you can do much more efficient training because you don't have to uh, train a very complex task anymore. You can split things up into subtasks. You can also split the data um, in such a way that you actually get um, wider wider data sets, right? It doesn't have to be necessarily that robot and task specific. You can train more, um, yeah, let's call it foundational also perception, for instance, right? Or more general um, uh, feedback controllers, if you want, and then combine all of that together into a overall robotics application. Okay. And by the way, and this is not something I will show, but in principle, if you can make things somehow differentiable, in principle, you could still train this whole thing end to end. I'm still, uh, I wouldn't say I'm against training things end to end, but this lets you make progress uh, with, with less data and, um, and more general data in, in such a way. Okay. Well, with that, maybe just a brief overview, um, especially on the perception side throughout the years within my group, we have uh, built up a lot of these building blocks that um, are going to be important that now we use on our robotics applications, starting with visual inertial uh, localization and mapping. So where really the focus is more on the kind of accurate motion tracking side of things um, rather than the map. Um, so with OCVIS and OCVIS 2. Um, and then we have elements of, of dense mapping that we're interested in um, that allows you then, of course, to do some motion planning, collision avoidance, and things like that, all the way up to bringing in semantics here, obviously heavily leveraging some elements of machine learning, um, allowing you to more uh, to do more advanced task planning, human-robot interaction, um, all the way up to perhaps representing the world in terms of objects, um, objects that might be also moving, perhaps even people um, that are quite obviously also moving and uh, and deforming even. So uh, it's a particularly difficult task, but I would argue quite important too. So these are somewhat different levels that you might have to choose from um, depending on the task at hand, right? So very basic things you can do with uh, the bottom layers here and more advanced stuff, you might want to go all the way up to the top. So here's an example of perhaps a more uh, advanced task, right? So we've all seen these very impressive uh, videos from Boston Dynamics uh, and the likes. Where, where robot uh, is, is, is performing amazing um, control actions and here like handing over a box. But we have to admit also, uh, while this is super impressive, it is also still quite specific tasks in quite specific um, environments, typically um, to a large extent uh, engineered and hard coded for, for these kind of demos. However, we would uh, my vision, let's say, is to go towards a world where we can just ask the robot, you know, in any kind of environment, hand me the box and it will just do it. And I will argue that as a function of being able to do that, um, a robot will want to have these sorts of representations um, uh, that it reconstructs as I was just um, I was just introducing before. Okay, so maybe start with um, um, the more basic uh, bottom layers. Um, so this is something that we have worked on for, for quite a while um, in sparse probabilistic uh, multi-sense effusion or visual inertial slam specifically, um, where you just formulate everything probabilistically. Say you are formulating the reprojection errors of a bunch of uh, 3D landmarks in the world here, right? So you need a detector, you need to match them across image frames, um, these, these detections, and now you can formulate the reprojection error as the difference between where you detect these points and where they project, and you can simply then formulate an optimization problem with that. What we also will assume, and this is what makes it probabilistic, right, is that these error terms are normal distributed um, with a covariance in the sensor measurement space, as given as, as R here, right? 
And this lets us now also combine very, very different sensor modalities as long as we can model them uh, with the approximation that they might be normal distributed. We know or we assume some covariance matrix. We can combine all of these error terms, including, for instance, um, so that the red ones here is uh, IMU uh, integrated um, IMU errors uh, or some kind of postgraph errors that we also include here. And we can formulate a uh, batch minimization, non-linear least squares problem that this actually boils down to. So this is really the basis of uh, what we've done in, in OCVIS, also OCVIS 2, um, a state of the art visual national slam system. And we've also extended it actually to include, for instance, uh, GPS uh, positions, GNSS when available. So you can just kind of bring this in and out uh, depending on the availability. So this is something that Simon here has worked on a few years ago. Then the next building block, um, and this was really also quite important for the example that I've shown uh, previously uh, in the forest, the next building block is some element of dense mapping that allows you to do motion planning um, or perhaps also some collision avoidance when, when doing locally, um, where we use explicit free space representation. So we, we're using a, a probabilistic formulation here again um, for occupancy and we have explicitly modeled the free space here, the free space represented in blue, right? So this is what you have actually observed. And this can be now distinguished from the gray areas which are unobserved and therefore potentially unsafe to fly into. What's also important is that we have this representation here in multiple resolutions or adaptive resolutions. So you're trying to be accurate and, and detailed only to, at the surfaces where it's actually needed, where there are details and in the free space, you can uh, prune things and represent them really quite coarsely as big chunks of free space that then allows you to do queries very, very fast. So now we can do um, really quite fast motion planning in here, also through uh, quite long distances as for instance, might be needed in the forest. And the next element that made this whole thing work is that you actually chop up things into submaps, right? So if you want to have a scalable system um, in which you might need to do SLAM, where you have loop closures, where things actually change, you can no longer just use one static uh, map representation. It, it breaks down. If you're traveling long enough, you will have sufficiently high changes that as a sort of holistic um, monolithic map representation just won't do it anymore. And the common approach is to then chop up the map into submaps that are in our case here anchored to the visual inertial slam systems keyframes. And then they will be moving around with these keyframes when the slam trajectory changes. And the next thing that you might have to do is that you have to also pair this with the references that you're actually following, right? So if you have an hour reference trajectory here, uh, say you want to represent that in a, in a world frame, then of course, once the, uh, the submaps realign, we have to actually also make sure that this uh, refer reference trajectory gets also updated accordingly in a way that the, the, the drone in this case doesn't feel a difference such that it doesn't kind of jump around, such that the controller doesn't get disturbed. Um, and you want this to be also continuous, right? So you might want this to somehow be interpolated in a way that uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, have any um, discontinuities in, in this reference. So these are all kind of engineering elements that have to come together if you want to make such a, a real world application work. Um, one more thing, we have also been working not just with vision, but also with, with LiDAR. So maybe I can just briefly introduce, this is ICRA work. So you can see that also um, for those that are coming to ICRA, at ICRA I can talk to Simon, um, where we are using these kind of sub maps that are based on uh, LiDAR measurements in this case. They can also be produced from, from depth cameras or from predicted depth. But the idea here was to actually directly have an error term formulation for one point cloud with respect to a map. Um, where the map is an occupancy map. And so you can now actually just evaluate uh, a LiDAR point here inside this occupancy map, the logots occupancy map, um, without having to form any kind of uh, ICP type data association. So it's a data association free uh, error term that we can formulate here. So just basically looking up the um, logots occupancy value and the gradient, which is all available in our map representation, we can formulate error terms um, for, for LiDAR points. Sorry, I'll just uh, finish this video here. And this allows us now to do, um, to formulate these kind of error terms 
as map to map or if you want uh, scan to scan alignment um, as well as for the kind of life maps um, in alignment with the current uh, currently built up occupancy map and this of course then allows us to do much more accurate uh, visual inertial and lidar slam because we can actually integrate all of these error terms again jointly into this kind of nonlinear least squares problem um, that i introduced before and it's still real time right so now because we we can formulate these error terms they're really quite fast uh, they're just lookups in our uh, in our map and don't require any kind of um um, ICP kind of point cloud processing. And we still get the sort of coherent uh, overall map representation if you superimpose all of these sub maps. Okay, so this is another building block that it can bring in, but of course it's 2024 and uh, we are doing um, also something with uh, foundation models, vision language models. So I have to show you this uh, recent example here. It's again, the same system that I've just introduced. Um, so you can see here, this is doing, it's doing live slam. We're also doing color fusion uh, for visualization here in our offices. And by the way, this whole thing runs on, on just a, an Orin. So you can really also deploy it on, on smaller drones or so. Um, so, so far, this is just a more traditional visual inertial slam system. Um, but what you can see in a second is that as you're actually reconstructing this, we are also aggregating vision language features um, in a kind of fused way. So we are, we are aggregating them from different viewpoints and fusing them in the map such that now we can do open vocabulary queries of this map, right? So we can just go in uh, live as the, the drone, say, moves around, we can actually ask for different things and localize them in the map. So I'm really quite excited about this because um, this should now allow us to really do uh, these sorts of um, more open-ended uh, task execution in previously unknown environments. So there have been a few works, of course, already coming out in this direction, um, but, uh, but we can now actually do that um, with a kind of live slam system on board uh, in the loop and run these queries as, you know, maybe a, a robot still explores an environment. Okay, but now let me take a step back and uh, let's move a bit up this uh, pyramid that we, that I was talking about previously. So we're also interested in uh, objects. So, so far I haven't really talked about individual objects and how they might be moving. So this is some work from a few years back that we did where we tried to do precisely that. We again use this kind of idea of sub maps um, that um, now is applied to having one sub map per object. And then once uh, we have kind of like one sub map per object, you can also move these sub maps around um, just as the objects are moving around. So, so here we are using um, actually photometric and ICP error from, from the RGPD camera to track initially the camera against um, the world, assuming things are static. And then you're combining that with some instance detector, um, instance and semantics understanding, of course, using deep learning to um, initialize these individual objects. And at the same time, you will then want to use the um, RGB and ICP residual to detect which of these objects might now actually be moving versus uh, uh, be static. So we're combining really these more traditional um, error terms again with machine learning elements um, in order to build up such a system. And then once you have detected which objects um, are not consistent with this kind of hypothesis that things are static, we can again use um, ICP and photometric tracking to track the individual objects relative to the camera that at this point has already been tracked. So I should perhaps emphasize here that really we don't at this point use any prior information about the geometries of these uh, um, of, of, of these elements here, right? So we're really trying to build up everything from scratch. Um, we are trying to um, track the camera against an unknown environment, build a map of the background of an unknown environment, uh, and then detect 
uh, track and reconstruct simultaneously um, these unknown objects. So this is perhaps a bit artificially hard, you might say, I agree. And you could see also that there were some, some issues with it. Um, some, some elements were not perfectly tracked or, or reconstructed. So this is it, is it is a hard task to do. And one thing that is perhaps particularly hard about it is that objects that are uh, moving, especially when they're rotating, they're inherently changing um, illumination, right? So the, they are no longer, they can no longer be treated as, as Lambertian, even though the object maybe themselves are Lambertian, but the illumination changes. So this um, assumption of photoconsistency really fundamentally uh, is wrong. So we invested a bit more time in, in trying to tackle this um, by instead trying to learn feature maps um, for alignment rather than using directly the RGB values, the pixel values directly for photometric alignment. So the only thing that changes now in the photometric error term um, is here you have the corresponding pixels in both images A and B, right? Uh, but now you look them up in a feature map that uh, are basically specifically learned features for the purpose of, of tracking. And what, what our kind of innovation here was uh, is to also add some level of uncertainty um, or confidence in these kind of feature maps for alignment. So we're also predicting in a sort of self-supervised learned fashion these uh, these feature maps um, or these uncertainty maps here per pixel in both images. Um, so what this allows us to do is, well, it, first of all, it, it, it proved to, to make things more robust rather than just only learning feature maps directly. And also this allows us now to have a sort of probabilistic um, um, error term formulation again, right? So we can again, because this is all weighted now with uh, the uncertainties, we can again um, combine that with say inertial measurements, for instance, or with ICP terms. Um, so it lets you directly integrate this whole thing into this kind of typical probabilistic nonlinear least squares uh, formulations with, with other sensors. Um, now, the good thing about this is that you can actually learn the whole thing end to end in a kind of course to find scheme. Um, so we have these image encoders here as a sort of Siamese architecture, right? So we have these two view encoders um, of, are centered around both the live view and say a keyframe view or a previous view. And you then go down in this kind of unit type architecture um, from a, a so you have the kind of finer grained feature maps, then you get the coarser feature maps, the more high level feature maps, perhaps. And what's also quite important is that um, once you go to the sort of lower resolutions, then you can have a, a fully connected uh, a network that actually predicts the initial uh, pose or the initial pose change um, that can then go into a Gauss-Newton type rolled out uh, refinement um, that, that you can see here in a kind of course to fine manner, right? So the initial pose is fed to the, to the coarsest uh, Gauss-Newton alignment, and then it goes finer, finer, finer to um, ultimately predict the final pose. So you just need now to, uh, to have ground truth supervision uh, in here, um, and, and then you can just kind of learn these features implicitly through the task of predicting the correct pose or ultimately optimizing uh, the correct pose. And this works quite well. Um, so you can see here, um, compared to uh, a few benchmarks um, where we're just trying to align now a live frame that was a bit changed. It was quite substantially changed relative to a keyframe and then we actually deturb it, perturb it quite um, heavily with, with a light and the alignment still works quite well. So this was another element where really um, using machine learning really, really helps, right? So going from just um, RGB and depth alignment as, as was introduced say 10 years ago or so, um, this, this really doesn't work in such a case, right, at all. So here is where learning data associations uh, really, really helps. Okay, um, I wanted to still talk a little bit about another element, um, which we haven't so far, which is about uh, predicting geometries. So far, we've only talked about reconstructing geometries. Um, so here's what happens when you're, say, just trying to do TSDF fusion. Um, so you have an input point cloud, say, from just one view from an RGBD camera, and you can do TSDF fusion, have a really quite incomplete view here, right, say, of this chair. 
And then, of course, what happens is that you, you're adding more frames, um, your TSTF reconstruction gets better. Ultimately, you would expect that if you have moved the camera, say, around the whole uh, chair, of course, then you will have at some point a complete reconstruction for a robot. However, it's really quite useful uh, for many uh, applications, I will argue, that you still have uh, as much as co possible complete representation of, say, this chair, right? So you you might want a an algorithm that actually completes the geometry. Now, what is important, and this is a difference to some of these uh, baseline algorithms, is that the um, predicted reconstruction or the completed reconstruction is plausible, of course, that's that's important. I will argue um, all of these um, are plausible, but it, you really want it to be complete, as complete as possible, right? So not just more complete, but representing um, the most likely, let's say, complete geometry. And importantly, you want it to be consistent in where you have already observed, right? So you don't want to just have a plausible representation of a chair, like the, the middle one here is a plausible representation of a chair, but it is inconsistent with what has already been observed, right? However, our approach here uses this kind of conditional architecture that was trained in such a way that it will predict um, things that are a geometry that is consistent with the partial input uh, that is actually um, reconstructed here. Right, so now what you get is um, that um, you're adding more frames from different perspectives and the uh, the TSTF uh, input, of course, gets gets better and better. And at some point, when you have seen everything, uh, the two representations will just kind of converge to the same thing. Now, you can actually plug this in into a whole kind of object level kind of slam system again and um, use it for the tracking of, of moving objects. So we see that here. And we can actually also show that this really helps with the robustness too. Uh, because we, we can now kind of anticipate what the geometry might look like, even though it has not been seen. And that also helps in the uh, in the geometric alignment uh, part of it. And, and that's also, you know, especially true when you have occlusions, for instance, right? So we can now quite, um, quite robustly track, I'd say, these, these objects. I have to say, though, that this is still category specific, right? So the network... Uh, the, the 3D completion network has to know that this is a chair. Um, and so, of course, you could say, sure, then you have to just learn uh, different um, completion networks for different categories, um, all the categories that you might be able to detect, with, say, your um, object detector of choice. Okay, now let's bring this into robotics again. So far, I haven't talked that much about robotics anymore, but of course now the idea was that this could actually be quite useful for manipulation. So this was a recent collaboration here with um, Sami Hadadin's lab, um, where we now put this whole idea of completion into the loop of grasping objects. So the, the setup is that the camera actually sees things from the opposite side than uh, where it grasps from, right? Um, so you have really quite incomplete uh, inputs. And that makes it, of course, hard to grasp, right? Um, so now running this through our object completion um, algorithm that I was just introducing and combining that actually also with an element of uh, confidence estimation here. So you can see red is where it's not very confident about. Uh, blue is what it has already seen. So this is more, it's more confident about this. Um, now we can put this into the loop of, of grasping, of uh, grasping uh, poster prediction, and then ultimately uh, a, a post solver and grasp execution. And we could show that this really um, improves the robustness um, uh, of, of grasping uh, very much, very significantly, as opposed to only processing the inputs uh, directly. And just maybe another application uh, to show you briefly that we are also working on is to kind of use these ideas in the context of uh, constructing, uh, of, of building and deconstructing uh, structures. So this is some kind of collaboration with uh, the architecture department here. Now, in this case, we actually don't have to complete too much the geometries. The geometries here are, are quite well known. So this is more about uh, pose estimation of, uh, of, of known elements, which I will always argue is also an important building block, right? So sometimes you might know the geometries and it's all about just uh, estimating poses and 
uh, and then planning and executing tasks around that. But sometimes you don't fully know the, um, the geometries of your objects or maybe not at all. And then these kind of approaches of completion or reconstruction or a combination of the two can be quite helpful. All right. Now, maybe the last element um, that I wanted to briefly talk about that I think is really also quite important um, has to do with people. I mean, all of these applications, they will probably involve uh, in some function also people around robots, uh, especially on construction sites, uh, on all kinds of everyday manipulation um, applications, right? Um, so for a mobile robot to understand what people are, are up to is perhaps a good idea. So we now formulated this idea of um, estimating the uh, the posture and and shape and of course also position and and, and orientation of um, humans, let's say in a world frame, but as observed from a moving camera. So we're really posing this problem of tracking motion, uh, human motion from a moving uh, camera as a slam uh, problem. So that's why we call this whole thing body slam as well. Right, so the idea, maybe I'll just stop this for a second here. The idea is that we can now use these quite well-established um, networks that will predict the uh, posture and shape of a human, but sort of at the per image level and only relative between say the camera and the uh, uh, and the human, right? So there's no notion in, in, in these sort of computer vision algorithms originally about uh, a, a world frame, let's say. So we can now use these and combine that um, also sorry, and combine that with a motion model. So we also learn a sort of most likely way of how a person might move from one configuration um, to the next one. So from one image frame to the next one um, and use these predictions now in a joint optimization problem together with uh, the more traditional kind of error terms of uh, reprojection error. And we could show that uh, this leads a really quite robust um, human motion tracking system that at the same time also estimates the camera motion. And what's interesting is that actually when you bring in this motion model, this is really quite important to not only to smoothen the kind of estimated trajectory, but actually also to make the whole thing scale aware. So this is kind of interesting that now all of a sudden, um, because you kind of know the, uh, the, the motion and the sizes of, of humans, um, you can even in a monocular case, you can estimate the whole scale um, of, uh, of the motions, both of the camera motion and of the human motion. Now, of course, you can now bring in all the other stuff uh, like stereo constraints, like IMU factors. And this is what we did as an extension later on. And the whole thing just gets vastly more robust. Um, so this is now the kind of stereo visual inertial case and the whole thing is just much more robust and accurate. Okay. All right. So just um, I wanted to, one more word. I, I have something like five or 10 more minutes, right, Ido? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Good. So I just wanted to briefly point out that uh, simulation, I think, is, of course, um, a very important element in, uh, say, training and evaluation of some of these things. So this is actually something that we have been working on with guys from, from Intel and, well, now Apple, uh, together with uh, with Mike Roberts here and Ladlin Colton and, and, and others, and also this uh, Chinese startup, uh, Kujale. Um, where we are now actually taking this idea of just rendering data sets uh, to a level of uh, really interactive simulation. So having a realistic, uh, these realistic environments, and these are uh, kind of layouts and scenes provided by the startup Kujale, and we can put this all into a kind of unreal based simulation environment and also simulate robots in here, having everything kind of uh, object centric in the sense that, uh, as you've seen before, objects can also be uh, be moved. And so here's just some initial uh, uh, results from sim to real transfer, for instance, that we have been doing using this simulator. So this is something we've recently open source. Maybe some of you have already come across. Uh, here's also some other scenes, not the typical indoor scene, but a large warehouse that we can also simulate. 
Um, so yeah, uh, you, you might want to check it out and it's kind of ongoing development. Uh, it's called Spear and, and hopefully this will, uh, yeah, will continue as a, uh, a sort of community development project that hopefully boosts um, all kinds of robotic uh, task training and, and evaluation. Okay, let's come back to, to robots again. Um, drones um, in particular. So so here's uh, another kind of more recent example where we now really couple the, um, the perception side uh, and uh, mapping side with, in this case, uh, drone flying around. So this is actually the case of, of exploration. So um, you have this task of a drone being uh, flying around through an unknown environment uh, with the goal of really reconstructing everything, finding finding everything. Now, this was not just about reconstructing and discovering, say, free space, but it was also tasked with reconstructing specific objects. So for instance, chairs. So you can just task the robot with finding specific objects. And what we have done here actually is included in the kind of uh, information gain-based maximization criterion, um, also an element of having to reconstruct objects of interests uh, to a level of detail that is required. So it will actually try to fly closer uh, to these kind of objects and also making sure that it's seen everything uh, from close enough such that it will certainly find all of these objects of interest. So this kind of now forces you to combine uh, the kind of um, object level semantic understanding um, with uh, a, a robot task, right? Um, one more thing that we did to now really kind of close the full loop of uh, of SLAM here, visual inertial SLAM and mapping uh, was in the context of safe and easy teleoperation. Um, so we have now um, we have the SLAM system, we have we have maps, accurate positions, uh, position controller and so on. And now we actually have put in, in the collaboration, this was by the way with Angela uh, Scherlich's lab, we have now this kind of safety filter um, that makes sure that whatever kind of high level teleoperation reference you feed in here, um, it makes sure to always stay clear of, of the obstacles. So this really then makes it very easy. You can you know, hand the controller to, to a kit um, to kind of fly this drone around and it will make sure that it just never flies uh, close or into the kind of objects or, or the, the world um, as it reconstructs it, right? So also important here, this is not just localization against a known map or something. We really reconstruct here uh, the map on the fly and make sure that the drone only ever flies into guaranteed safe uh, space that is actually observed uh, to be free. Again, here you can see the kind of live rendering um, of the commanded references and the uh, the safety filtered references that the drone is allowed to, to fly to. That is, of course, ideally as close as possible to the commanded reference. Again, this is at ICRA, so, so you might want to check it out at ICRA. Okay, so I just wanted to maybe... Uh, spent the last few minutes to just briefly mention also the control side of things. Um, all of these drone kind of applications, they only work because there's also a, a controller on board, right? Um, the, the the more sort of slow stuff that I've show, shown so far, um, we were just using uh, this kind of more traditional separation of having an onboard simple uh, PD kind of attitude controller. And then you're using a linear model predictive controller around it where you basically model the uh, closed loop dynamics of the attitude control system as, as a linear system here, right? Um, and then you just have a, a, a linear model predictive controller. But we have also tried out a bit more recently um, what to do in terms of fully non-rigid, uh, non-linear uh, rigid body dynamics. So directly modeling kind of from rotation speeds to, uh, to, to the states of, of the robot. Um, and then going through non-linear model predictive control. So this allows us to, to be more aggressive um, in, in, in our controller. So we still have to identify now parameters. Now the parameters are actually physically meaningful parameters, right? Like uh, drag coefficients and, uh, and, and inertia and so on. And, um, and we can now formulate this sort of um, finite horizon uh, type nonlinear 
uh, optimization problems um, where we penalize position in the yaw and, and the velocity and input. And this allows us to now, as I mentioned, right, to do really quite aggressive flying. Um, so we can uh, do these sort of uh, flips on the right hand side, you can always see the kind of onboard uh, predicted or simulated um, trajectory. And you can also see here that it really matches quite well uh, the real world, right? So this was the, the simulated, the finite horizon kind of prediction that has been optimized. And then on the left hand side, what's been executed. Of course, this requires quite accurate um, parameter identification. So this can be a bit tricky, but it's nice, right? It allows you to also uh, to, to fly all kinds of maneuvers. Uh, you don't need some kind of training and and then be sure that you, you're staying within the training regime or so. You can just do all kinds of stuff, even deactivate motors and flying upside down and things like that. And we can also use this kind of model-based um, idea to identify failures. So we, when we are actually comparing the model to the actual behavior of the of the of the robot, when we are turning off a motor here, don't tell the controller. We can actually identify that there's something gone wrong. Identify which rotor has actually been switched off, and at the same time, you can then reuse the same controller uh, with just different input limitations to save the drone immediately. You have to be quite quick, otherwise the drone is on the ground and crashes. Right? Okay. So just a, a few more examples, maybe just to show that this doesn't just only work once. It also works now in a kind of trajectory tracking kind of case. And yeah, you can save it even though one motor has been uh, found faulty and you can still safely say, uh, take the drone to a home position, for instance. There you go. All right. And we didn't do it just once, right? So this is maybe another important lesson that if you want to do real world robotics, uh, things really have to be robust. And so we had to really show here 16 successive experiments, 100% detection recall and 100% precision. And you really need that, right? You don't want a, 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 an identification system that reports you uh, a lot of false negatives. That's super annoying. Um, um, uh, that reports you false positives. That's super annoying. And also missed detections. Uh, that's, of course, then a safety concern, right? Okay, so maybe just as a, as a last example, we have augmented this kind of uh, drone flight also with uh, a capability of, of manipulation. So having a delta arm attached to it. And you can now reuse the same controller by just um, adding some additional um, uh, terms that you want to, to follow, like the end effector uh, position to, for instance, um, write something on a whiteboard. So this is what we did here. So now we have an additional um, term in the optimization problem, the nonlinear MPC problem that controls the 2D position in the uh, plane of the whiteboard and at the same time also maintains a desired pressure. So it does a, has a force kind of feedback uh, element in the, in the optimization problem as well to uh, maintain the right kind of pressure when in contact. Um, such that we can actually write stuff on on here. I can probably see where this is going. All right, it's done it. And again here, maybe I'll skip forward a little bit, um, but just to say um, you want to again do this not just once, but uh, several times on the slightly different conditions in order for it to be actually useful. Okay, and then just to conclude, we also did this as a kind of two and a half D uh, printing, not just 2D printing. Um, so this was a larger collaboration back at Imperial uh, with Mirko Kovac and others, um, where we're using these kind of drones to 3D print uh, concrete here. Um, again, with this kind of delta arm, the idea of the delta arm being able to compensate uh, some of the inaccuracies of, of the drone control or the disturbances that the, uh, the drone undergoes. Um, and then also here's an element of uh, printing larger structures. 
Um, now this is a bit more inaccurate, and actually the inaccuracy of, uh, of 3D printing such a structure has also really required us to again go back and have some element of perception in the loop, right? You can't just do this as a purely feed-forward uh, printing process here. You have to see what you have printed. Um, so what we're doing here is there's actually a second drone that goes up. You'll see that in a second um, that goes up and uh, looks at the structure scans the structure, see what is actually printed. So we can see here overlaid uh, our dense 3D mapping um, that we then apply uh, in order to adapt um, to what has actually been printed and, and making sure that you don't crash into your into the previous layers or you don't print from too high. Right. Okay, with this, I'm at the end. Um, thanks a lot for, for listening. Um, I hope I could convince you that um, some of these contributions uh, could be useful um, um, going, so it's combining kind of uh, SLAM and spatial AI, more traditional um, elements of reconstruction and estimation, also with elements of machine learning regarding semantics, regarding objects, people, also for data association and completion of geometry, and that this actually now allows us to very well integrate things with um, real-world kind of planning and control uh, to deploy these uh, these robots. I think I see still quite a, a bit of challenges now in, in, in this day and age as to how we can leverage, um, of course, what is now the big topic, large language models, and connect them to these kind of spatial AI representations. So I think this is where we will see a few more uh, works coming out and uh, hopefully also from our lab, um, how, to, um, how, to, how to do this connection, how to also um, scale robot learning in the same way as large language models that are purely in the sort of uh, digital space, right? How, how to how to really now go from, um, how to really go to physical action in the real world rather than uh, just outputs at the level of, of, of words. I think there's uh, quite a few challenges uh, around there as well. Okay, but I will stop here. And of course, thank again uh, the team that has done all the work and all the sponsors that have sponsored this work. Thank you. Stefan, and uh, do we have any questions? Oh, uh, we have one whole head from Vera. Oh, hi, Stefan. A uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, so I'm Vera. With you. Uh, I'm with uh, the ACFR. So I would like to um, ask uh, so, one question is related to the work um, of detecting the pose of people from moving cameras mm -hmm. and yeah. you were mentioning that uh, you are also estimating the the motion of uh, people um, obviously the people are non-rigid so which part is it only the torso motion that you are estimating or you you estimate the motion piecewise or point se3 motion um, yes good Good, good question. I, I went through a bit fast, perhaps. Um, so we are we are really trying to estimate all of it, right? So um, it's the SE three um, of the of the root, if you want. So this is typically the kind of uh, the hip, uh, the coordinate hip. frame handed around the, the hip, um, right? And then the actual configuration in terms of uh, of well, some some form of joint angles, if you want, right? So there are these kind of theta theta parameters. Um, that that estimate the configuration of the of the humans. So this is the um, this the simple model that is is quite a popular model that is being used as a parametric uh, human model. Um, so we estimate that too. So this is this is um, kind of uh, yeah the whole trajectory. I think is about sixty dimensional in the end. Um, that is as estimated as a moving trajectory, and the uh, motion model also predicts those. So it actually the motion model predicts a relative motion um, to the to the hip frame um, as a as a sort of uh, SE three type motion, um, including then also the uh, the new configuration um, of, of of the human. What we also estimate actually is the shape of the human. So but that the configuration the is from frame to frame. So it's yeah. a, and and then the motion it's just um the motion motion estimation applies that 
through the configuration to uh, the other end points. Um, yeah, so, okay, I'm not sure I completely understood now, but um, yeah, I mean, th think so of the it- The 3D motion a... is just of the torso, and then yeah. the configuration is frame to frame. Is that- um... it's, it's not relative, it's still absolute. If if that was the question, it's still an absolute say configuration of of the human posture, um, and also actually the human shape. Now the human shape though is is static. That's just um, right. We assume that the human uh, the human sh shape for a specific uh, individual at least stays the same throughout the sequence, um, and then the posture changes the whole uh, the positions and orientations of the arms and 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 upper body and all of that changes over time. Right, just like the uh, the position and orientation of, of of the sort of torso itself uh, changes over time. So it's just a, it's it's an extension, if you will, from from sixty to something like sixty D um, of the whole uh, the whole uh, human uh, non rigid kind of configuration. Yeah. And uh, so another question is related to combining the two main components of uh, your works. So the perception with control in a same estimation problem. So mm -hmm. you mentioned at the beginning uh, that you are kind of treated them separately and then you want some sort of, or you, you foresee some system that would train them end to end, but at a lower level. So how do you consider the integration between the perception um, and the control would uh, would be done okay so you mean, so you mean in in the context of being able to train it end to end uh i'm not really talking in the context of training or learning uh it's just in the context of integrating both so for example you showed the example of the two quads so one was uh, 3d printing and the other one was coming and doing the map of yeah. the structure that was 3d printed so what if only one robot is doing the the map of the 3D printing structure, but also um, controlling the next actions. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, to be honest, this could also be the same robot here. So we, we only separated it in that case for kind of practical reasons of not wanting to also have a camera on the printing robot because uh, you have, well, maybe you have an idea, but once you've tried it, this is really, really messy, right? So if you, you have this foam spraying around and, and so on. So this was just for practic more practical reasons that we had two robots, one that does the scanning and the other one the printing. So there's no reason otherwise, so algorithmically um, to, to have to have but two robots. But still algorithmically, and, uh, they, they would be separated things and there would be various little communication between, uh, for example, uncertainty and things like that would probably not be communicated. Um, yeah, it, it could be though. I mean, in this case, this this application didn't explicitly use uh, uncertainty, but in principle, it, it could still be, right, if it's, if it's useful. So I think, I mean, this is, it, it's the advantage, but perhaps also the drawback of these modular systems is that we have to make these choices as to what representations we use to mm -hmm. communicate, from, say, one module to the next. Now, here we chose uh, from the kind of um, perception to action. Um, in the 3D printing case, it was just um, we kind of converted things to a height map ultimately um, and extracted extracted uh, the sort of top line, uh, the, the rich line of, of what has been printed. And then that was fed into a, a sort of adapted planning um, that would plan the next uh, the next print layer and just, well, effectively in the end, it was quite simple. It was just, uh, adapting the height of it, um, such that it's, uh, it's, it's not crashing into it. Right. So that this requires quite a bit of engineering and choices and it will have its limitations. It's, it won't be very general. Um, but, um, yeah, it's it, at the same time, it's, it's kind of easy to understand what's going on, um, as, as a roboticist once you designed this thing. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any other questions online or online? Uh, I do have a question, Stefan. So um, you, the showcase uh, the reconstruction in addition to, sorry, the object detection based on your like arbitrary uh, text input uh, in addition to the reconstruction. 
Is that also a limited to a category of objects that you showcase, or it's uh, leveraging something like second anything? Uh, yes, I should have I should have been perhaps more clear about that. So you're referring to the kind of vision language uh, understanding, right? Uh, it was a bit difficult to hear acoustically. Oh yes. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. No. By the way, this was not object level, right? So this was more, if you want, uh, sort of semantics understanding. So there's no concept of objects uh, there. Just to 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 clarify that side, um, and it was fusing vision language features. That actually, in this case, they were just coming from from Clip. But yes, there could also be all kinds of other vision language uh, or foundation models. Um, as long as uh, they produce somehow features that you can then back project and, and integrate into your world map representation. Um, but the advantage now is that you can do open vocabulary queries, right? So you're not limited um, as opposed to say the uh, kind of uh, semantic segmentation approaches from say, you know, six, seven years ago or so, you're no longer limited to the categories um, that you, you predetermined. You can now just really ask questions about the scene um, as it exists and find individual uh, uh, elements. Okay, so we are, the demonstration you, uh, you showcased, it's uh, highlighting the regions in the reconstruction mesh, like a monolithic mesh that is, uh, that belongs to a um, object that uh, de uh, detected in the image and projected onto the mesh. Yes, yes. So it's just it's just highlighting whatever you're interested in, right? So uh, maybe I can show this again. Um, one second. All right. So yeah. So you can see here. If I scroll forward. Well, I will try to scroll forward. Okay, so, sorry, it doesn't allow me to go forward. Um, but yeah, you'll see it in a second, right? So um, this is still just color fusion and now a kind of dialogue box pops up and you can input any kind of query. And then this goes through a language encoder and the language encoder then um, basically um, allows you to query all of the maps. So this is effectively just some some kind of dot producting of the language features with the, the, the visually aggregated features from the 3D map. And you get this kind of um, hotspots, right, of, of where the sofa is. So this is now here on the on the right. Thank you. And uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, Tom? yeah, hi, Stefan. It's Don here. Um, great hi. I wanted to uh, go back to the part of the talk where you, you correctly pointed out when a scene is dynamic, even if it's Lambertian, it's not really uh, photometrically consistent over time anymore. Um, and I wanted to maybe uh, bait you a little bit and ask about scenes that were already non-Lambertian. So if I've got shiny or transparent objects. Um, and so the solution you've you proposed there is to work in the feature space instead of in the photometrics. And I know you're aware of nerfs and Gaussian splats, and I, I just wanted to get your opinion on where, like, where you think that might be heading. And in particular, is is the right approach uh, to think in feature space, or is the right approach to pursue um, representations that handle these things? That's a very interesting question, and I I, I don't really know. Right, I think. I think both have their pros and cons. Um, and I would imagine uh, like be, being pragmatic here, probably um, it's it's definitely worth exploring both. And maybe the answer is different from, from different, uh, say different for different applications, different purposes, right? So of course, if you want to somehow reconstruct things uh, with the highest possible reconstruction accuracy, including also things you might be interested in, in, in transparency and so on, and somehow, um, have a high fidelity uh, model that you can render afterwards, let's say, or that, that you somehow understand what's going on in terms of transparency, then I would argue, yeah, probably these sort of uh, uh, nerfs or Gaussian splatting representations are, are more useful, right? Um, now, now, for the purpose of just accurately 
um, tracking the camera or tracking individual objects or making sure not to fly into them. Um, I could imagine that kind of learned correspondences um, is, is, is perhaps more useful because they, they're super robust and uh, they let you perhaps more accurately predict where the surfaces are. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is a, a, an area of active ongoing research. Uh, we are also looking into it. Um, and um, yeah, I think, I think we should explore all kinds of things. Um, but I think it's definitely very interesting times because we can now sort of start to to, to really reason about these things. It, it used to be super hard in the past, right? But now with these new representations and combining things with, uh, with, with, with learned approaches, especially also learned data association, I think it can, it can do amazing things all of a sudden, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, but at, at the same time, I think, I mean, we have experimented a bit with, with both nerves and, and Gaussian splatting. And uh, one thing that maybe you can echo this uh, is, is that maybe things are, looking quite well to render once at least you're staying relatively close to the original trajectory and and people are very impressed it looks very nice but it's it, it maybe in some sense also not so surprising that if you're just rendering and you're close to the previous observations it, it's not so hard a problem but but once you're getting a bit further away in your viewpoints once you want to really understand where is the free space where are the surfaces then you realize that things don't look as as good anymore, right? So so for for a robot maybe this might be problematic, or for applications where you want to see things from from very different viewpoints, then all of a sudden you have to do a bit more than just realistic rendering. You have to you have to really have a higher level of understanding and 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 proper representations. And yeah, we still have these problems of, of both nerves and, and Gaussian splatting kind of reconstruction approaches that you have this kind of floating stuff in free space and you have maybe reflections that are represented as still some sort of um, of, of stuff and geometry that is actually behind the surfaces. And it, it looks good, right? Once you render it from, again, from close to where you've originally observed it, but but it's still wrong. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess all I want to say is I think there's still a lot of room for improvement, um, and uh, it is very interesting times to to try and do that. And I think again, all of these approaches are are valid to do so. Yeah, totally agree. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Don. Right. Uh, let's thank Stefan again. Yeah.